Hi, welcome to lesson three of functional annotation for the BVCN. Today we're going to talk about possession, position sensitive models and specifically that's going to lead us to talking about the tool set hammer. Um, so the last couple sessions we've been using the NCBI PGAP or the prokaryotic genome annotation pipeline as a way of uh, organizing where we are in terms of how we're progressing and what we're doing in functional annotation and where that fits into the, a general pipeline to begin with. So Previous lessons in lesson one, we talked about uh, the power of ORF finding and how we do that nowadays using um, tools like uh, Prodigal and then the more complex tools like GeneMarkS for um, eukaryotes uh, and, and things like Maker and Breaker. And then we, last lesson in lesson two, we talked about uh, BLAST-P um, and its role in using uh, local similarity alignments to determine uh, annotation. And then in this week, we're now here on this side of the pipeline, where we're going to be working with uh, HMMs and, and searching HMMs to de determine um, function based off of homology predictions and, and using that tool set. So to advance this, so what we're going to do is, you know, I'll talk a little bit about what was discussed in lesson two, which is this idea that we can um, predict functions to some degree based off of an alignment to known uh, proteins with known functions. And so this happens in various ways. In lesson two, we talked about this uh, you know, from a perspective of BLAST2 or BLAST, BLAST plus, where we were um, aligning uh, proteins and short fragments against each other into a database of some capacity and then saying, because these things look similar and that's, and homology leads to these situations where homologous proteins tend to have similar functions, if not identical functions, we can say something about the annotation of these uh, genes with some level of uncertainty associated with it. Um, what we're going to talk about today with the position sensitive models, we take that and add an extra layer to it. And the idea behind this is instead of a, a local alignment where we're concerned about relationships between matches and taking some information, uh, and this might be something that if you've uh, worked in uh, biological systems for a while, you might have done, uh, we go and we collect sequences and then uh, create a multiple sequence alignment, which is represented here. And so we're still doing something very similar to what has been done when we were working with BLAST, which is we're looking at homology and how it relates to uh, how proteins are related to each other. But in this particular instance, now we're looking at collecting multiple proteins that we think have similar evolutionary histories and uh, using a um, multiple sequence alignment to, 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 to determine how those relationships exist. And so use of multiple sequence alignments are gonna happen cursory going forward, both in this tutorial for lesson three and in four and other lessons, uh, but we probably won't spend any one particular uh, lecture topic talking about the different multiple sequence aligners, just that they exist currently and, and maybe we'll get to it at some point. So BLAST uses uh, local alignments like we just uh, talked about. It uh, is a com computationally greedy algorithm Right? So that means that it requires not only doing all versus all searches a lot of times, but that once you find a match, you then have to build out that pattern to see how well uh, the overall match is. So it can be a, a little time consuming. Some of us might have, might have experienced that if you're looking and searching against very large databases. So we can use probabilistic models and probabilistic approaches uh, to homology to look for similar uh, features, but in a faster rate using some information that we have already gathered and kind of somewhat reduced our search space. And so it's a probabilistic approach that we're gonna be talking about, which means it incorporates random variables and probability distributions uh, into a, uh, an event or phenomenon. So this phenomenon we're gonna be looking at is how proteins are related to each other. We're gonna work specifically uh, using a type of probabilistic models called a hidden Markov model. Uh, or HMM. And so hidden Markov models are not biologi biologically specific. If you Google hidden Markov model and, and look at what the Wikipedia page says, you'll see that the, it's basically applied to every type of um, large scale data sets that are out there. And it's just a way of uh, generating information um, relative to um, what you already know with some un an inability to predict what's actually happening behind some closed system. We'll talk about that more uh, with the diagram in a little bit. Not that the diagram helps, it can be still very convoluted. Um, HMMs require building a profile based on a training data set. And, that, and I've underlined that because that's what's really important here is that it requires 
having some information before you go and start building that profile that we're going to use to do the searches with. Um, it's based off of other machine learning approaches. And one of the advantages to it is that even when we're dealing with homology is that it's very sensitive. Um, so it allows us to target very specific things uh, and get back matches that were, are, are very targeted and give us a lot of information. So I mentioned before that HMMs start with a multiple sequence alignment. And so here we have a, uh, an alignment just like, uh, like that, um, where what I'm looking at here is specifically uh, this part of the uh, alignment, which gives us an idea of how conserved any one particular column is. And there are several regions that have really high levels of conservation across multiple sequences from uh, multiple organisms here. So I've boxed out two of them here where they have very high alignments and you can see that the, the, uh, the, the amino acids align really well there and compared to other areas where there are gaps and, and maybe not as, uh, consens uh, not as strong of a consensus. And to look at it a different way, what multiple sequence alignments allow us to do with HMMs is to target regions that are conserved outside of other elements. And so not always, but a lot of times these regions uh, relate to elements that can't change as part of the protein, right? So these might be things that are uh, important structural elements to them, so, right? it, so the conformation of the protein determines its function. And so therefore, if you have uh, a structural element that's required to keep a certain uh, conformation, if you make a mod uh, if there's a you know a mutation there, you would lose that ability, and therefore you wouldn't have a functioning protein anymore. The same with catalytic sites. So the catalytic sites are important for um, targeting exactly what type of compound your uh, protein is acting on. So if that changes, you you might have elements. And so what we do is we rely very heavily on these areas that are conserved uh, between pro uh, between proteins of different organisms, and start to ignore and and factor in less. Uh, which elements are not conserved. And so that, that's where the accuracy and the sensitivity comes in on this, right? We can target areas that are very specific to a protein and to a protein's function, regardless of what the, the sequence similarity looks like for the rest of the, the, the protein. And so while we're talking about that, it's important to think about proteins in uh, different ways than uh, maybe are you're used to thinking about, or maybe you heard about in general biology and, and now are coming back to it and thinking, well, what, what were these things all about? And so there are two major elements that we're going to uh, think about when it comes to proteins. And so the one is uh, our domains. So these are elements of the tertiary structure uh, that function and evolve independently of the rest of the protein. So these are things that are conserved in terms of what they do for the protein and that if they change the entire, maybe the whole uh, capacity of the protein to perform whatever function it is changes. And so an example of this way might be something like the ATP binding domain. So this is a domain that commonly occurs in enzymes uh, that have, uh, that need to attach an ATP and, and take the energy in the breaking the phosphorylation bond to, to energize the protein or, or perform the reaction in some way. And that particular setup, that binding domain is very common and conserved across many proteins. And so it functions almost independently from the rest of the protein and has one particular um, uh, function to it that we can target and look at based off of a much smaller uh, subset of the protein, not the whole element. The other thing that we're gonna talk about is a motif. And so motifs occur in the primary structure and they correspond to signatures of biological function. And so one example of this uh, that comes to my mind pretty often is the heme motif. And so this is a motif, so this is a amino acid sequence right here, where based off of this motif, this uh, CH and then any two amino acids and then another H, um, we can predict and have some prediction that this might be a heme binding site. And so that structure kind of forms on a, a small scale element and would bind an iron uh, um, atom uh, in that site. And so you can count heme motifs in a protein um, on a pretty large scale to figure out what's going on. And so both domains and motifs fall under one large category, which is a feature. And so a protein with a feature is something that has either a motif or domain defined on it. And so how do we go from a multiple sequence alignment uh, to an HMM or position sensitive uh, uh, model? And so what we do is we take a bunch of proteins that we are fairly confident are homologous and share the same functionality. Uh, we'll go through some alignment step uh, where we then select out the region that has good alignment and maybe the higher levels of similarity. Um, we can do this and pick out large fragments of a protein. So you might have an area of conservation 
a gap, an area of conservation, we can select all of that. Or we can break it up into those two distinct areas of conservation and create uh, various sets of models in, in that way, right? So in that situation where you have conservation, a gap, conservation, we can make three models out of that. One that encompasses all of them, and then one that encompasses each region specifically as either a domain or a motif. Once we have that uh, nice uh, region, we then have to compute the statistics and probabilities of this. We do this using um, a couple of tools, and then we'll talk about uh, how that functions in, in Hammer in a, in a few minutes. Um, and then once we have that, we probably would do some type of uh, manual curation to look for where the cutoff is between noise and trusted scores. And so we might do this by uh, targeting a set of proteins, making our alignment, making our model, and then comparing back to a larger data set and seeing how that compares and deciding, okay, anything above this threshold is real and anything below that threshold might be just noise in terms of matches. And so what we do is we form these uh, matrices uh, or profiles uh, that basically rank how often we saw, see specific residues in a specific position as part of our uh, motif or element that we've aligned. And so here's a, a, just a scoring uh, profile matrix where we can take our query and say, well, what is the score that we get based off of the position of the amino acids in this small piece of peptide um, compared to our consensus sequence that we have that we fed into our model and then ended up with these scores, right? So in position one, an A gets scored slightly higher than K or T and so on and so forth through the rest of the uh, sequence that based off of this initial alignment that we put in. And then when we start to score it, we can say, okay, well, the score is really good if it looks like A, K, P, K, A. And so we have A, K, P, K, T, E. So in this particular situation, you know, four of the six uh, amino acids in this peptide score very highly in the right order. And then we have some slowly degrading levels of um, scores as we've changed the sequence and, and it deviates more and more from the consensus of these uh, six um, proteins that we use as a, an alignment um, for our matrix, uh, matrix creation. And so one of the things, um, and this is where we talk about um, how a hidden Markov model actually works. Like I said, it's something that's uh, very common uh, for machine learning approaches in a number of different fields. And this uh, diagram, uh, even for me personally, uh, when I was making this presentation, takes a long time to fully understand, um, but it, it goes to the heart of what a uh, hidden Markov model um, is actually trying to do. And, and one of the benefits of it in, in, in protein space that we get to work with. And so what we're actually trying to do here is so this represents our sequence right here, begins at some point, and then through some series of peptides, um, we get to the end of our protein. And so what we can do is in the model, we observe these elements. This is what we can say about um, the organization of the protein that we're looking at. And then we compare through some, what essentially amounts to a, um, it's almost like, you know, you conceptually can think of it as a, as a brick wall. We're using this information and how it relates to some state on the other side of the wall uh, to predict how well uh, what we're looking at, our particular pro uh, peptides, how well they actually model or predict some other entity that we can't actually see all the elements to, right? So the reason for that is that we've taken uh, the sequences and compressed them into an alignment and converted that to a matrix. So we're not actually directly looking at, at any point, a one-to-one -one sequence comparison, but we are looking at um, the overall uh, probability of those states at any various point in time. The other thing that happens though is that because hidden Markov's models function the way they do, we can actually account for gaps in the alignment. And so that's somewhat what these red blocks are representing. There are multiple pathways for us to get from our sequence um, observation that we have of our protein that we're searching to the state that is hidden from us that's part of the alignment and the matrix. And that if, if we come across an area that is uh, unaccounted for in the model, we can actually go from here to here, and then if it wasn't connected to D1, we can move on to this M1 space and over and over again. So we can actually have in our sequence uh, spaces that allow us then to uh, come back to it and say, okay, it, we, we don't go exactly in the same order, but these elements are still related to the hidden states that we can't see as part of the alignment matrix.
And so we could do this, um, take away all of the math, and, and just use the tool sets that are available to us uh, as biologists, where we can take our, again, working with our, 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 um, our, our protocol for this, we're gonna take our query sequence set and then perform a multiple alignment, and then use a specific uh, tool within the Hammer tool suite called HMM Build to convert our multiple alignment to an HMM profile. So again, here we have our individual observations that we're looking at from a particular uh, sequence, and then the various state relationships that occur as part of the multiple sequence alignment, and then the conversion to the um, HMM matrix. And that what allows us to take this profile and compare it to a number of target input sequences to look for the region uh, or regions uh, that are then uh, similar to the profile that we've uh, submitted, right? And so here it's identifying this particular region due to its similarity to the overall alignment that's present here. We use a tool called HMM search, and then we get one result back from some large set of target sequences. So I've mentioned Hammer a couple times, so it's worth talking about that as a tool of what it does. So it's a search tool that allows us to look for a sequence database using um, using our HMM profiles that are we are being are either built or or we're collecting from a, a repository. And there's a couple of programs that are worth mentioning uh, within the HMM uh, Hammer. These are not this is not an exhaustive list. The exhaustive list happens in the manual. So we have our ability to we can make our own multiple sequence alignments from sequences using an aligner within uh, Hammer. Um, this normally is not something that happens frequently, but it's something that you can do. Normally, uh, other multiple sequence aligners have a tendency to be better at that job than a program that is designed for something else. We have HMM Build, which converts our multiple sequence alignments to a profile. And then they have all these other tools that are part of this, right? So P Hammer actually functions the same way that BLAST does, where it's just looking for local alignments and you can search a, a protein versus a protein database. And then we have our two main tools that we use to search HMM space, which are HMM scan and HMM search. And the relationship here is just the order of which is the query and which is the subject. So HMM scan takes a protein sequence and compares it against an HMM database. And then HMM search takes HMA, an HMM database and searches it against a protein sequence. In the next slide, I'll talk about what the difference between that actually uh, manifests as. Uh, HMM convert, which allows us to convert the, the profile formats of an HMM file. This happens a lot if you have an old model um, and you want to run it using a new version of Hammer, you might have to run HMM convert. HMM fetch, which allows us to take a database and pull out a single model from it just based off of its name. Um, and then HMM press, which is where we take our HMM model uh, and compress it into a binary format to make it uh, run a little faster when we use HMM scan. So, why would you use HMM scan versus HMM search? That's a great question and one I think um, a lot of people either struggle with or maybe aren't sure why one is different from the other. So first off, HMM scan and HMM search are almost exactly the same in terms of what they put out in their output. Um, they compare one profile to one sequence at a time, their bit scores are identical, and they both can be saved in various outputs, you know, emphasizing the tabular output uh, because you know, that's what we can use as a, in our, with our computers to, to get some, um, to process the outputs in a, in a meaningful way. So the thing that's different is that uh, for HMM scan, you're comparing a protein sequence against an HMM database or a series of proteins versus an HMM database. And the way that HMM scan works, even though we compress our HMM database with HMM press and make it a binary uh, compressed file, which helps us a little bit, what happens is that for every protein, we have to load up the whole HMM database that we're searching against. And every time we do that, it's actually pretty computationally expensive. And so in the particular instance here, the compute time, the actual comparison is this protein and this model similar to each other is much, much smaller than the uh, input output time. So what happens is, is that every time you have a new protein, you have to open up the whole uh, profile. And so it, it scales very quickly that opening that step every time. And so in smaller databases and smaller data sets, it might not be a problem, but when you get to something very large, it can be very time consuming. HMM search, because it flips it, it opens the HMM profile once and then searches through your query proteins from there. And so there can be some arguments made here about size cutoffs, um, where it makes sense where if you have a lot of sequences in a small HMM database, maybe it makes sense to use HMM scan and then the vice versa. So if you have a few number of proteins in a large HMM, HMM database, you might want to use HMM search. 
But overall, uh, computation times in, in both scenarios, HMM search tends to run faster. So that's a, a good point to point out um, why you would use potentially search over HMM scan. And so spent a lot of time talking about Hammer. There are other uh, position sensitive model search tools out there, and some of them come from our friends at NCBI. And so specifically, there are um, elements that you might have seen before in passing if you've been using BLAST before uh, called SciBlast and RPS Blast. And so SciBlast stands for Position Specific Iterated Blast. And this is a pretty interesting way of approaching using a, an NCBI database to, to generate uh, search matches. So what you do is you provide a query. That query goes into the database, finds a bunch of significant similar matches. And then from there, NCBI makes an alignment and converts that alignment into a, a, what they call a position specific score matrix. It works very similar to a, an HMM where we're converting our information to a matrix and allows that to look for patterns. And then we take that newly created PSM, PSSM and then again, compare it back to the same database to look for significant hits that are now based on that conserved feature. And so this is something that happens on the fly when you submit a query sequence. So it can be pretty time intensive because the NCBI has to do the search, pull it back out, create the model, and then use the model and do another search and before it gives you uh, results. And then you would get those results and you can make choices on them the same way that you would with a BLAST result. Maybe you use them to further re uh, refine and create a new model. The other option that comes along with this and it's built off of SciBlast is this reverse, posi posi reverse position specific BLAST. And so this is the exact same concept except that the PSM, PSSM is pre-computed. Um, where it now acts as our query instead of our subject. So instead of giving it a single protein and then having all those iterations happen that I just described, what happens is, is that you take that PS PSSM, use it as the query, and then that will then search against your database and generate your output. And so one place that this happens because it's the built-in tool is the NCBI uh, Conserved Domain Database, the CDD, which we'll talk about at some point in the future. Which brings me to the conclusion of lesson three. Uh, lesson four will start a series of lectures and examples uh, where we start, start to talk about specific databases um, and how they are, are different from each other. And so we'll start off with a series of databases and it might be one lecture per, um, uh, per database or it might be a couple combined where we're gonna do things where we take large databases like PFAM or CAG or eggnog where there's a variety of functions of uh, uh, you know, maintained within that uh, particular uh, data set, right? So KEG has a lot of functions within a lot of different models. And then we'll also then talk about databases that are, are specific, where they have a specific function where they're looking for particular elements about them. And so some of those might be like the carbohy carbohydrate active enzymes in the CASI database or the anti-smash um, um, components that allow us to, uh, that look for secondary metabolites uh, going forward. And so with that, uh, I'll conclude lesson three and see you in lesson four.